Hi, I'm Allison Meyer and I'm a trustee on the Millbrook Historical Society Board and we are about to travel down the Duchess Turnpike, which is in Duchess County, New York. It begins and ends there. But today we're going to take a road trip through time. Um, what I hope to do is to give you an idea of the sites that we drive past every day and we may not notice these sites that are having to do with the turnpike. Um, I drove past these sites for 30 years and never really saw any of this. These sites are telling us a story that relates to 200 years ago or more. Uh, th the basis of this project was a map and a charter. Uh, the charter is only 8 to 10 pages long. It's from the state. And the maps, um, well I say maps, but what I want to say is the original map hangs in the Dutchess County Records Office today and it's from 1804, which we'll get into later. And there are two copies, we're very lucky to have two copies of this map. Um, 1891 a copy was made and also another copy was made in mid-century um, by the um, county clerk of Dutchess County at that time. And both of those copies are held in the uh, Millbrook Historical Society archives for our use. So we are ready to get started. Uh, the Dutchess County Turnpike Company, it was established April 5th, 1802 by charter under the New York State Legislature. And I want to point out initially that in 1802 it was chartered and 1804 is when the, uh, the, the road was laid out, mapped, and surveyed, and then uh, filed with the Dutchess County clerk at the time. And I will refer through this talk to the 1804 map, and that's the reason why, because it, it was two years later that it was actually filed. Um, now, to start, in the charter there are 21 charter members listed in the first paragraph of the charter. And not surprisingly, uh, Philip Hart and a William Thorne are among those 21 men. Uh, they are names who are familiar with us. And there are some other names that we will become more familiar with as I keep talking. Um, eight men were named immediately to subscribe investors and they were told that they shall in May next, which would be the next month, provide themselves with a book to subscribe those investors. Um, once 600 shares of the 2,000 they were aiming for were subscribed, a two-week notice was placed in all Dutchess County newspapers and uh, those men then were to meet and choose 13 directors, one of whom would be the president. These men then embodied the company. Uh, they were the ones to make the rules and regulations that govern the corporation. They were the ones to purchase, hold, and convey land. And they were the ones to hire agents and clerks and surveyors and workmen and even artists, as they're listed in the charter. Uh, now we can ask why they, why would these men have invested? Um, and the point was to improve local trade and um, land values and bring prosperity to the community and improve safety based on the road construction and also though an underlying factor is social pressure to provide for these, um, you know, the prosperity of the community and to, to invest in the community itself. So there was philanthropy um, as an underlying incentive. Uh, next. Okay. Uh, one day a friend and I were driving down uh, Route 23 from Great Barrington uh, one day last October and we saw this sign and we quickly turned the car around and jumped out of the car to read what it was all about and there is a toll house standing next to this 
sign, this uh, state historic marker, and it is the Eastgate Toll House. Uh, there are two reasons that this sign <clears throat> excited me. And it's because what I saw in it was a larger movement of turnpikes, then and now. Now that that um, <laughs> that there are other people interested in turnpikes, the history of the turnpikes, uh, the interest is alive. And then that, uh, as we read this, the Columbia Turnpike, which was uh, chartered in 1799, uh, was located on the site and it linked Columbia County farming and industry to the Hudson River ports, just as in Dutchess County. Um, it's the same story, trying to link the eastern bounds to the Hudson River ports and then to world ports as well. Um, back in the 1790s, both Dutchess and Columbia saw a flood of immigrants coming from New England. Uh, land speculation was on the increase. There was a growing demand from Europe for wheat, flour, and other products. And to quote our former uh, town historian, Carmine D'Arpino, he said, the Dutchess County farmers were stumbling into a new era with vigor. <clears throat> and what they needed better than any, more than anything was better transportation, and that meant, above all, better highways. Uh, turnpikes, uh, well, what I want to say is they needed better highways. Uh, canals at this time were limited and hard to finance, and railroads were not yet spoken about. So turnpikes became the transportation innovation of that generation. 1830, 1800 to 1830, uh, one-third of the businesses incorporated in New York State were for turnpikes. Not all those businesses were successful, um, but the point of the turnpikes was that they were legislated, it was an organized form, they could lay out the road and they could charge the fee for um, construction, for maintenance, and so on. Uh, next. Okay. This is the Duchess Turnpike, uh, running from Poughkeepsie all the way to the Connecticut border and Sharon and, and down to Dover as well. Um, just to start, this is a map. We mapped out the Turnpike on the on Google Maps. It's Google My Maps, and it's something that anybody can use for their own travel purposes to designate sites and routes. Anyway, getting back to the Turnpike, um, the as I said, the Turnpike ran from Poughkeepsie to a uh, the home at or near Timothy Beetles. It said, which is. Timothy Beadle was in this area. This is Washington Hollow, and this would be 82 going north. Uh, so he was right where Washington Hollow Plaza is, his home. So it said that it would run from Poughkeepsie Courthouse through the settlement of Pleasant Valley to Timothy Beadle's home. And then it would continue to the Connecticut border, Sharon or Salisbury, uh, for the Sharon branch, and also a branch down to Dover, over Plymouth Hill, to Dover, which is now Route 343. Next. This is a, um, a rendering of the Poughkeepsie Courthouse that is part of a mural in the, the post office in Poughkeepsie. Um, but this shows the map. This is the original 1804 map, um, the copy, the one of the copies that we have. Um, this is Market Street, and this is Main Street, and so Main Street then continues on down as the Duchess Turnpike. Next. This is Timothy Beadle's house. So this is Washington Hollow area. There is the home of Timothy Beadle. And this says the road to Bengal. Um, there's another site on the map that also says road to Bengal, and I always find that amusing that all roads lead to Bengal. Next. This is the Dover End, uh, the Lawrence Belding House, and you can see as you would come down over Plymouth Hill, and you come to this point, and, and still today, you either go north or south onto Route 22. Well, this is that point, and his house stood there, 
um, Taylor Oil is here. So if you come up past Taylor Oil to the stop sign to go up the hill, his house would have been right across the road. Uh, Stephanie Mori in the town hall helped me a great deal. She's a hidden treasure in the town hall. Uh, she's spent 30 years looking at various uh, aspects of the historic properties in Millbrook. And she had this photo of Lawrence Belding's house. Um, the yellow portion is what would have been there in 1804. When I went to look for this house, um, one day it wasn't there and um, I found that um, aerial access on, in, well, online um, for Dutchess County that this house was raised to the ground uh, between 2009 and 2013. Now there is Dr. Balding's house which is the, the, the Sharon Salisbury end of a Sharon branch. Uh, you find this house in this area, this is the street view, um, if you're going back this way, it's where you enter New York, there's a large brick house and Paley's Market is off to the right. Um, that, and his, I don't know if that brick house was actually his house, but that's where it stands. Um, something I forgot to mention was that the, the three names listed in the charter to note the points on the turnpike where it would go to and, and end up was Timothy Beadle and Lawrence Belding and Dr. Balding. And I thought that was a fun jingle. It's Beadle, Belding, and Balding. Easy to remember. Next. Uh, the road we travel today is the road they traveled yesterday. They built it and we came. Which takes us back to a little more history. Next slide. I'm coming back to this slide. Again, it's a, a Google map slide that we used to map out the course of the turnpike. Um, these two circles are landing points on the uh, river. Uh, this is the Rhinecliff Landing and this is the Upper Landing in Poughkeepsie. Uh, when the, ind the indigenous culture in this area already had networked trails that would lead them to the landings that they used for trade and for travel, for crossing the river. They, they did a lot of travel and networking. Uh, when the earliest settlers of European descent started populating the eastern half of Dutchess County as early as 1720, 1730s, roads to the river landings were one of the first necessities. So even back then, they, they needed travel points, they needed access, and they made their requests known. Uh, I like to point out basically what I call ghost roads, so those, these roads are still there in part. Um, one is the Dover Road, which go, it was known as the Dover Road, um, going from Plymouth Hill to Little Rest to Mechanic, up to Hearts Village down to Washington Hollow, and then it wandered up to um, the town of Rhinebeck and to the Rhinecliff Landing. Uh, Helen Wilkerson Reynolds said that in 1718, this may have been nothing more than a path, but by 1748, it was accepted as a road. Then, if this is Washington Hollow, which it is, <laughs> um, this is called Filkinstown Road, and this is the road that led to the Upper Landing. Um, it actually diverges off Main Street and goes on to Mill Street, and if you follow Mill Street down, um, eventually you come to what is now the Upper Landing Park. Uh, and, and the first mention of this road really was 1743. So there are early roads, also Christian Hill Road, if anyone's familiar with that, off Plymouth Hill, it went up and it, it continued over the hill to what became Sharon Turnpike. Um, now if you go up there, it's a dead end. Um, now, farm clearings grew in number, and as clearings grew in number and they were able to raise surplus, routes of travel 
were established. So we're going from paths to cart tracks to wagon ways and then declared public roads. There was somewhat of a structure to this, though. In 1713, the Dutchess County Board of Supervisors was formed, and shortly after, in the 1720s, they began appointing road commissioners to each town or precinct at that time. Uh, these road commissioners were then responsible for making sure that roadways, wagonways, were kept clear, and residents actually had the responsibility to maintain those. They were summoned to maintain those and had to pay if they couldn't take the time out to help maintain their section uh, for a certain amount of time each year. Um, so the residents could request to these public highway surveyors, as they were also called, uh, road commissioners, to create a public road. And I spent one afternoon at the county records office going through microfiche um, just a whole afternoon <laughs> of reading descriptions to say the, the inhabitants of such and such area uh, request that this area be made into a public road. And then it would be filed with the county clerk, who at that time was Henry Livingston. And so a lot of this happened between 1722 and 1762. So after this, residents, of course, then were more responsible for their their upkeep and maintenance. Next. But there were complaints and in 1754 to the road commissioners a letter was written by a group of freeholders and inhabitants of the Nine Partners Patent. A certain road is exceedingly bad and can scarcely be used with any team at any times and especially in wet weather. They requested that a new road be laid out so that they might with more ease transport their produce to the landing places. Apparently, maintenance and res reliability was still a problem. Next. <laughs> so, there were pre-existing roads before the turnpike. Uh, now we can ask, what did the turnpike construction do to improve road travel? And this, uh, just a title slide I used, a section of the map, this is actually where Duchess Day School is. This would be Calarne Road. It says Old Road to Dover. And then this is called the old road, which apparently wasn't being used even at that point in 1804, but it comes out by uh, Little Rest, Walbridge Farm. Next. Okay, the road commissioners. Now this is a new set of road commissioners. These are commissioners appointed under the Turnpike Company. The president may appoint three disinterested and discreet freeholders of said county, not residing in any town through which any part of the road shall run who shall be commissioners for the laying out of the road pursuant to the sect. And the commissioners shall cause an accurate map of the survey of such road, designating the track thereof to be made and filed in the Dutchess County Clerk's Office. Um, and, and we saw the result of this. We have the names of the three uh, commissioners who had to oversee this, and um, they had to sign off <laughs> under oath. Um, so we have the paperwork for that. Uh, each of these commissioners shall be paid a sum of 250 for every day they're employed in these duties. So they're using dollars and cents at this time in the charter, even. Next. The company may uh, enter upon lands and take as they saw fit. Um, so they, they tried to run the turnpike on the existing routes that were there, but where they needed to uh, change track and um, an upgrade, they were able to do this. So it shall be lawful for the corporation or any persons employed by them to enter upon any land where they deem it proper to construct said road and to lay out, survey, and labor on such routes and contract with the owners for the purchase of so much thereof as may be necessary for making said road, erecting and establishing gates, toll houses, and all other works to the road belonging. And this is the part I think is fun. In case of disagreement between parties as to the value of land or damages, the value shall be determined by an appraisement made by two justices of the peace and oaths of six reputable and disinterested freeholders. 
Um, now, in case of insanity, it shall be lawful for the president, directors, and company to take possession of such land with a value on damages paid to the persons entitled. Next. And I thought this was interesting, rather than trying to describe it, this is the actual language in the charter of how the road would be constructed. So the president's directors and company shall cause a road to be laid out at least four rods wide. Now I had to look up to see how wide a rod is, and it's 16 and a half feet wide. So 16 and a half feet times four is 66 feet wide, which sounds very wide, but um, I guess this was the swath that they were looking at um, for the turnpike corridor. And that would, of course, then include, uh, you know, the lane, the side drainage, and the rights of way on the side. Um, so, um, 28 feet at least of which, of that width, shall be embedded with stone or gravel, other hard substance, at least one foot thick. Uh, to secure the solid foundation. And <clears throat> this road shall be faced with gravel or stone uh, to secure firm, even surface, and it will be rising toward the middle by a gradual arch, but not so steep that a wagon loaded with hay will be overturned. These are the details <laughs> you must think about. Uh, and that the waterways on each side of the arch may be constructed so that in times of snow will not be so deep as to endanger the overturning of sleds. So now we can start to see where the, the, the whip comes in. Okay, next. Okay, now, this is an example that I'm using for the um, improvement in the road. The orange lines are what was, and the black line is what is, um, and it still is. <laughs> so this is uh, the turnpike, or, well this is Route 44 now as we know it. This is the Duchess Turnpike as it was built in 1804. Here is the Sharon Turnpike where it branched off. So Farm and Home Center, uh, Cornell Cooperative Extension is right here and the cottonwood out there, and uh, Millbrook cabinetry, and copper fields. This is Washington Hollow area. This is South Road. So obviously, m much of these roads are still here that were pre-turnpike, but there were changes. Um, when I used a 1797 map, so that would be pre-turnpike, that was uh, what, seven years before the turnpike was laid out. Uh, I saw this area, and on that map, this was not there. This black line was not there as the turnpike was finally laid out. So what I saw was this line coming down from Sharon, and it would go all the way up to Sharon. And then I saw this one, which was the Dover Road that went to Dover, and they met across the stream and then you know come south road and up into washington hollow but it was very confusing and it boggled my mind for quite a while um but then uh through deed work that stephanie mori had done um her work showed that terrell road is new and that so so this is new this section of the turnpike in 1804, and, ter and uh, the Sharon branch, it, it followed this route, but here it continued up through to cross the road to continue on as Sharon branch. Mm -hmm. Terrell Road was not there. Um, this is standing at the gate of the Farm and Home Center going out to the road, so here's the Duchess Turnpike, and across the road is the field, so the road would have come up along that tree line and just crossed right over there and then gone up onto the Sharon Branch. Um, so to read these captions, the Sharon Branch followed Terrell, then went northeast at this point, went northeast. The Dover Branch departed South Road uh, along in here and crossed what is now the quarry pond 
and continued east, uh, crossing Shady Dell, we think, and mm -hmm. coming out, we believe, across from Thorndale someplace at Barrycroft or, or Daytop. Um, oh, and then I also want to bring out, though, the reason for this change. Uh, you can see the confluence of all these streams. These are tributaries that lead into the east branch of the Wappingers into the Wappingers Creek. And it's wet down here. And you can imagine an ox and cart mucking through in the springtime, or even a fall like we had this uh, November 2018. Um, so this original road followed natural contours. This hugs the hill. It comes around on South Road. And uh, you know it, it goes along the tree line. It hugs the contours, the original contours, natural contours of the land. When they put the turnpike through, they straightened it. And I really think that's what the changes in the turnpike were all about at that point in time in 1804, um, that they basically made a road cut through here and um, made it more efficient. And now we'll, we'll look at that a little further. Next. This is the same area. This is Washington Hollow, the road to Bengal. This is the Sharon Branch, and <clears throat> this house is a David Lawton house. That's the house that is still standing across from the Sharon Branch, um, and I'll refer to it as the David Lawton house as it was in 1804. Um, and this photo, this is the uh, 1891 copy of the original 1804 map. Um, and it, it, it shows, the, the point I want to make on here is that it shows numbers. 63, 64, 65, 6, 67. <clears throat> and then for the Dover branch where it starts out, it's number 2, 3, 4. Um, these are road stations. So they're basically survey, survey points. And they tell a lot of what was going on. Um, and just jumping back again, this is Dr. Benjamin D. Laverne, that's what this road was called. It said Road 2, Dr. D. Laverne's house. This house in 1771 was um, down here, across from where Terrell comes out, right across that road. Um, so he was a, you know, the area doctor, he'd have to get out. Um, he was not not a charter member, but he must have supported this idea of a turnpike, I would think. Uh, okay, next. So these are the road station descriptions that I've written on this map, um, just to show that um, this was open land when they first put the turnpike through. This is the same map again, same photo, same map. Uh, road to Dr. D. Laverne's, this is Washington Hollow, this is the Sharon Branch. Um, but 6162, doesn't show on here, but it, it's it's a survey point, and it'll say fence north to uh, so many degrees on um, chains and links, and then this is the actual description that I copied down. It says to the southeast post of the piazza of Timothy Beadle to the 62nd station, should be in here someplace, and then number 63 to a stake on north side of Old Road near a well in front of Timothy Beadle's new house. We don't mm -hmm. see Timothy Beadle's new house on there. But they did not put everything on this map, which is interesting. <laughs> um, and then number 64 is to the southwest corner of William Germond's dwelling house. That would have been his house. The first in the town of Washington. So he was right across from what is now South Road um, with a little tavern sign. Uh, next. Now, number 65, this is where it's fun. Um, over the lands of said German, his lands, Dr. de Laverne's, which he lived down here, but he owned lands up here, open lands, and Amos Halleck, who owned open lands up here, to a black oak tree, which this says red oak, but that's number 65. So that has to be the black oak tree they're talking about. Um, and standing on Dr. D. Laverne's high land. Okay, now number 66 
is to a stake in Amos Halleck's land, flat east, descending west. Just as, you know, if you're at the Farm and Home Center, it's flat, and it goes down the hill towards the Cottonwood. Uh, and then number 67 right here, this is fun. So over the land of said Halleck and David Lawton, uh, to a stake north of the old road, nearly opposite the home of David Lawton, the branch begins. So they're talking about the Sharon branch beginning. And that's where it was placed then, and that's where it is now. So, um, so I think the point to make here is that they straightened this road um, to make it more efficient and maybe with their construction uh, specs that they used um, even though it still has to cross a stream and today there are even two little bridges there that you don't even know you're going over unless you really look hard um, they, they could build the road maybe uh, build it up better and, and make it straight so you had a little water, you had a little hill but um, that road cut did the trick. It's still there today. Next. Uh, which brings us to our TIPs, <laughs> a word we made up for fun, our turnpike important people. What we wanted to do was to see who is who among the men named on the charter. Uh, you know, I talked about Philip Hart and William Thorne. Uh, they were just a couple of the men. Uh, but we wanted to see what their interest might have been in the turnpike uh, features on the map uh, features on the map really reference their lives for us uh, it had been nearly 80 years now in 1804 since some of the earliest settlers of the nine partners patent began carving their lives into the interior woodlands so features on the maps uh, show this gradual increase in settlement and development so instead of roads marked only by buckhorn or long marked trees, we now see reference to fields and fences and mills and mill ponds, stores and taverns. So we see commerce happening, we see development happening, an infill of people, I guess. Um, instead of fording places, waiting places, we find bridges like we saw on that last slide. It said bridge place. And we see a number of those. That was a development in construction. Next. Our TIPs. Okay, so of the 21 men I first mentioned were in the uh, first paragraph of the charter for the Turnpike, we found that seven of them were located along the Turnpike corridor because the, the Turnpike map is, only shows the corridor, the tight corridor of what they went through. But seven of those men are on that corridor which doesn't necessarily mean really anything except that it was a good starting place and uh, you know maybe we could see some distribution of these men and, and where they were from. Four of those seven that we found along the corridor were in the town of Washington. So we think that we have a pretty good representation out here in the town of Washington. Um, and all four of those men owned some sort of business establishment. Um, Mills Philip Hart in Hart's Village had a mill and actually had a tavern at one point attached to it, it said. Um, down in at Four Corners is um, Evan Haight. He was a charter member. He had a store. And then there's William Thorne um, in Mechanic, and he had a store. And Colonel Rufus Herrick. It was actually a Benjamin Herrick who is listed as a charter member, but uh, you know we have a little more genealogical work to do, I think, but it seems that this would be a relation, Benjamin Herrick and Colonel Rufus Herrick, because he was a pretty prominent person. Um, his house, I do, I do not believe is standing anymore, um, but this is Tower Hill Road out on 44 now, and this is Short Road, and it was at the end of Short Road between Short and Bonacue Road. Um, I'm not going to be talking so much about him today, but... Um, and David Johnston, who built the first house out in Lithgow, he was a descendant of a patent holder. Um, we have a, 
uh, lightning bolt over his because he was not in support of the turnpike. And actually, the, the men out at the east end of Lithgow and on did not seem to support the turnpike in any way. They called it a wicked monopoly. Um, but that's for a later chapter. Next. Okay, this is a watercolor that was done by Jonathan Thorne when he was a student at the Quaker School in um, Mechanic, in what is now Millbrook. Um, and what you see is a, a beautiful new home that was built in 1800. So this is built in 1800. Um, it's Hart's Village. It's Philip Hart's house. Um, and remember the turnpike was then passed by the state legislature in 1802. So it's all current. Um, it's a beautiful barn, very functional. Um, an orchard and gardens with a fence, as I spoke about. Now we, we see more uh, status in front of places. And, and this carriage um, with a little scalloped edge, kind of fun. <laughs> it's not just your hay wagon. Um, and then we have a mill, meaning there was water right here. And it, the water power in this stretch is why Hart's Village grew as it did. Next. This, again, is the 1804 uh, turnpike map. This is the copy, one of the copies. Um, this is the turnpike. This is Hart's Village area. Here's Philip Hart's house. And this is East Branch of the Wappingers Creek. Now the East Branch begins in Little Rest at an elevation of 800 feet and drops 500 feet before it eventually reaches the Wappingers Creek in the town of Clinton. Um, you see not only mill streams now, but you see mill ponds. Um, many of these mill ponds were reconfigured over time. Dietrich had reconfigured them and, and there was a lot of work. But because of this water power, the, the change in elevation in the water power, it allowed five dams to be built in a one mile stretch in this area at one time. Um, so there, there's water power and there's, um, you know, it's a prosperous little center. But now where there is water power, there are also, there's water, and there are water crossings. So if you think about this, uh, let's see, Valley Farm Road is here, Stamford Road is here, this is Hart's Village, and this stream. Now, we think, having read over these survey points, road stations, and working with Stephanie Mori, we think that this, that the, when the turnpike was put in, it was an improvement. It represented improvements in straightening and bridge crossings. It may have run originally, um, possibly hugging the hill here and crossing a, a lower point on this east branch of the Wappingers, and then crossing up over here because of how the road station reads, um, that the new turnpike would be south south and west, I guess, of the old road. And then it may have come up and over the water. Um, that may not be completely accurate, but it's a concept <laughs> that um, the road changed. And this area, if you take a look someday, uh, this is a little bit lower and flatter terrain. This is very steep between the banks. And then you get up here and it becomes wider with a very steep bank around on this curve. So th now this says bridge, bridge place. So 1804, they put a bridge in. And this indicates there was a bridge. Um, so these were improvements. And what I want to point out is this bridge that we cross every day and we zoom across it unknowing of what history lies under that bridge. I want to show you the next slide. Okay. This, this is that bridge. Um, this is the bridge built for the turnpike, we believe, an 18th century bridge, basically. 
Um, it's the Stone Arch Bridge. And if you peek over the corners <laughs> from the bridge or down the road and try to see under this bridge, this re the remnants of this bridge are still here. There's a lot of rock outcrop, which maybe they used in building that arch. Um, it's a narrow area and very steep. And um, this then was the old iron bridge, which was well known at the time, but obviously um, doesn't stand anymore. Um, this was from a postcard that it was our picnic grounds and um, the iron bridge. So that's a lot of fun to look at and imagine. Next. Okay, on to another one of those TIPs. Um, actually, two more. Um, Evan Haight had a store in Four Corners. Um, well, I'll get back to that. Actually, Evan Haight and William Thorne were both charter members of the Turnpike. So, at the Four Corners, which is where the Halcyon Monument is, and Bennett College is here, uh, we find Evan Haight's store. And there's also Jaycox Tavern, which apparently burned down shortly after the turnpike was laid out. Um, but this is a tavern sign that took us about two months to figure out what that sign represented. Um, and then we were led into uh, the idea that it might be a tavern sign, and it makes all the sense in the world. Because um, uh, these people were designated as having taverns. And I also want to point out the meadow area. These are just signs along the turnpike that we see as, as you know, development and an increase of, of, uh, of usage of the land and the population. Um, now, Mechanic is where the Quaker Meeting House is now. Um, that's where William Thorne had a store. Uh, this photo is coming up out of Altamont Road. So the Quaker Meeting House is over here. The Great Schoolhouse would have been right across the road. And this lot, where there's, there's a house over here, stream coming through. There's a tannery on the other side of this road. Uh, but this lot would have been where William Thorne's store stood. Um, mechanic itself was a bustling place and had a colorful history all its own. It was one of the first settlements along this road and often mentioned, just as um, in the charter where it, it talks about the layout of the Dover branch, uh, it, it says through mechanic. Um, and it was settled by Quakers uh, who were there before the American Revolution, Thorne's parents among them. It was known for all that it offered. It had stores. It had the only post office for a time in the town of Washington. Also, Samuel Mabbitt had an inn for wayfaring travelers uh, across the road over here, um, going from New England to the Hudson River. So it was a well-established point. And, but focusing on William Thorne, who together with his brother Isaac opened this general store on the lot where I, I had pointed out, um, it became quite prosperous and being a noted depot for supplies for miles around. People would come from Pleasant Valley settlement and, and farther around to get their supplies here at Thorne's General Store. Um, that date on the building is 1795, and it's fun, having done the Turnpike Project, to look at all the different types of vehicles <laughs> and wagons, uh, two-wheeled and four-wheeled and uh, oxen and horses. Uh, we're drawing those vehicles. Okay, next. Can we? Uh, this is a toll house. This is not our toll house. It's the East Gate Toll House up in Columbia County on the Columbia Turnpike. Uh, this is the one that I had the state marker for initially, <laughs> the beginning of the slide set. Um, but uh, today, if you drive past there on Route 23, they have a big banner across this building, and they have the friends of the Eastgate Toll House. They're trying to raise money to restore this toll house. Next. And these are our toll houses uh, for Dutchess County. Again, this is a Google map. We use little flags for icons of the toll houses. So this is from Poughkeepsie, 
on out. Um, this would be Washington Hollow again. Timothy Beadle's house would be there, and then to the Sharon Branch, out towards Sharon and Salisbury, and then the Dover Branch. Now 3:43 down to Dover. Um, when we first started out, we could not figure out where the toll houses were. We seemed to have no reference to them. But on an 1867 Beers map, we started finding that they were labeled. Um, so from 1804 to 1867, um, that's a span of time. But um, we couldn't find earlier maps that designated toll houses yet. Uh, we're still in search. But um, in the charter, it says presidents, directors, and company will erect two gates between the courthouse and Timothy Beadles. So, uh, this is the westernmost toll house, and then in the town of Pleasant Valley, there happened to be two, and this is where Timothy Beadle would have lived. Um, so between the courthouse and Timothy Beadle's, there's actually three. Um, then it said between Timothy Beadle's and Sharon, there would be two. There's one uh, right in Washington Hollow and one out in Amenia. And then along the Dover Branch, there would be one. Now, when we look at that map, we'll see that for Amenia, it says toll house number four. So we counted one, two, three, four, five. So that means one of these in Pleasant Valley was added later on. And the state was able to make that decision uh, based on who was using the tolls and how they were avoiding tolls and that sort of thing. Next. Okay, I'm going to run right through these slides. This is the westernmost toll house on Van Wagner Road in Poughkeepsie. So it was right there. That's the street view now, today, what is there. Next. And in Pleasant Valley, one of the two in Pleasant Valley, one was just east of Bower Road. So east of Bower Road is the toll house. That's what stands there today. Next. In Pleasant Valley still, another west of Brown Road. Brown Road is here. Here's a toll house. That's what stands there today. Next. And that brings us to Washington Hollow and Copperfields. Um, looking at this 1867 map of, uh, of this area, uh, this is the town of Pleasant Valley. This is the town of Washington. This is the boundary. And this is a block that says toll house right on the boundary. And <clears throat> looking up tax maps, the boundary line between the two towns does actually run right through the building of Copperfields, what we know as Copperfields. We think maybe this building has a very long history. And in fact, in contacting both the town of Washington and the town of Pleasant Valley, I found that um, they pay a, a tiny, tiny little portion of tax to the town of Washington because there is 12 feet 9 inches of this building in the town of Washington. <laughs> so that's a lot of fun. Um, so the exciting thing here is that we think that Copperfields may have been the toll house, and I will tell you why in one second. But first, I just want to point out G.W. Florence. Uh, this house would have been right across from the toll, from Copperfields and the toll house, um, in line with three houses. There are actually four there now. Um, just keep that name in mind, G.W. Florence. Okay, next. Okay, Jim Sweeney found this article with a photo and caption, and I'm not sure which newspaper it is, but it was a 1983 article when uh, Dennis Horrigan was about to open Copperfields, mm -hmm. and it's showing a picture of that building, uh, saying in 1983, um, mm -hmm. in this 200-year-old old-timers in <laughs> 200-year-old building, um, he was opening the uh, wow. the restaurant. So that takes us back to 1783, which means in 1804 toll house would have been standing. Mm -hmm. So we have a little more research to do, but um, it's a very fun thought. And we've put this 
photo in here, this is again the Eastgate Toll House on the Columbia Turnpike, just because of the similarities. I don't think there was any particular type of structure they looked for, except that it would have to have been something that would hold the family, and, and being toll keeper, I'm sure it was a 24-7 job. Mm. Um, next. Mm. Okay, and all summer, <laughs> we thought that this, we were sure that this must have been the toll house. Um, it is to the left of Copperfields when you're standing in front, um, and we were really quite certain. But this one is much farther off the road, and when you think about it, how close uh, Copperfields is to the road, it makes all the sense in the world. Next. Which then brings us to the Amenia Steakhouse Toll House number four. And it says, let's see, on here, it says number four, Toll House number four. So this is uh, going out towards Amenia and going down De Laverne Hill. Uh, this would be 83 going up to Smithfield. The Toll House stood over here around that curve, mm. but what we were thinking, oh, this looks like the other low one-story building that we saw at Copperfields. You know, maybe they moved this building from here to here. We're not sure. But one thing to keep us, um, keep the mystery alive is uh, in eating dinner there one night, we asked the waiter to find out what all the names were <laughs> of, of the restaurant through the ages. And lo and behold, one of the first names was Fred Burke's Tollgate Restaurant. So, and that would have been when it's sitting here, the restaurant, but we don't know. So, more mystery to be solved. Next. Um, and this is the Dover branch. Here's a little rest um, going down and around. This would be Butts Hollow Road, so going around that big bend down towards Dover. This was the Dover branch toll house, and this is what we as close as we can find to that location, uh, you know, that's all we find right now. <laughs> Next. Toll charges. Uh, be it further enacted that as soon as such road is so perfected and examined, it shall be lawful for the president, directors, and company to appoint toll gatherers to collect and receive from all and every person using said road. That is to say, for any number of miles, not less than 10 miles. So, I guess under 10 miles you didn't have to pay the toll, um, but they would, they would, uh, you know, they had a chart of their charges. Next. Okay. For a score of sheep or hogs, now a score is 20, so for a score of sheep or hogs it would be 6 cents to pass through the toll gate. For a score of cattle it would be 12 and a half cents, so it looks like wear and tear on the road increased your price, for one thing. Um, and now we look at 12 and a half cents. How do you get 12 and a half cents? Well, back in 1804, um, and and for a, basically a generation after the American Revolution, they were still using the pounds, pence, and the pounds, shilling, and pence <laughs> uh, monetary terminology. And one shilling equals 12 and a half cents. So they were going back and forth on that. Um, it's apparent that a horse and rider was the cheapest way to go, and the most expensive way, at 25 cents, would have been in a coach or a phaeton, phaeton which, uh, when I looked that up, it's a very sporty carriage, um, and it also said it had four very heavy wheels, mm -hmm. so I don't know if it was the wealth they were charging or the the weight that they were charging. But a, a stagecoach was back down to 12 and a half cents, so I think they charged for pleasure <laughs> drives. <laughs> Next. Um, though nothing in this act shall require or entitle the toll gatherer to take any toll from any person passing through the gates who are going to or from a funeral or election, or who may have occasion to pass a gate for the common business of a farm, you know, the back and forth every day, and that becomes an important element in all of this, too. Um, or who may be going to or from public worship on a Sunday, or who may go to or return from a mill with grain or flour for his family's use. Hmm. So, next. Uh, that brings us to mile markers. 
Okay. Okay. I think mile markers seem to be one of the few relics left from the 1804 turnpike. It's one of those things that we can see. Um, and uh, but it, I think few of us have seen them. I didn't really see any until I started in on this project a year ago. There are stories in these stones that embody our love of nostalgia, starting with this one. Um, this stone has been photoshopped. Uh, Mike Spross from the Millbrook School System, who recently retired as, uh, from the art department, photographed this stone. And I think this is one out near Millbrook School. And he photoshopped it to say the Millbrook Milestone, founded in 1896. And when he retired, he gave this framed photo to each school office in the school district, which is very lovely. Um, he says some very nice things down here, but I can't read them that well right now. <laughs> um, but it, the reason he did this, the Millbrook Milestone, is because the yearbook from Millbrook High School has been called Milestone since the Thorn Building was built. 1896. So, next. Okay. These are our icons for milestones. This is, um, Kipsy's over this way. This is starting at the Taconic. We snapped this. Um, so from the Taconic over toward Sharon and then down to Dover, these are the milestones that we have inventoried at this point. Um, plus we have inventoried most of the others and photographed them. Um, it's good to update that inventory periodically. Um, now, said so the corporation, this is from the charter, the corporation shall cause milestones to be erected or placed, one for each and every mile on said road from Courthouse in Poughkeepsie to Eastern Extreme, marked legibly with the distance from Courthouse. Um, next. This mile marker, 11, you don't really see anything on it. Um, it's, it has uh, peeled off over years, I guess. But this marker is right across the road, across the turnpike, because they were all on the north side of the turnpike, placed on the north side. Um, it's right across from the northbound exit from Taconic. When you come off that exit, you can see this in um, winter weather next to the phone pole. And, and then this marker, 12 miles from P.C. House, they, they actually, sometimes it says Poughkeepsie or it says P.O.U.G.H. House, Courthouse, they labeled it, depending on who the stone, stone carver was, I guess. Um, but this is the 12 mile marker, which was right near Copperfields, and it was missing. Um, it's still not in that place, but it's in very good hands at this point. Um, the reason someone had picked it up who lived in that area, because Central Hudson had come through uh, one day to clean up a fallen pine tree next to Copperfields, and they ran over it with their truck. So uh, he's picked it up, and and it may be replaced one day, uh, back in its original spot. Next, Mile Twenty, Sharon Branch. This one is actually the first one I saw. Um, it's directly across from Charlotte's restaurant, um, going out towards Amina. And this stone has significance because you see how these stones, you know, it's embedded in a, a stone, you could say a stone wall. Um, it's one layer around it. Um, we thought when we saw these stones um, with masonry around them that Maybe during WPA, uh, they, the, you know, FDR had these stones um, preserved in that way. But I recently found a letter written by a George Sherman to the Dutchess County Historical Society in 1916, so that's before the WPA. And he said, I would like to request to have a George Florence, so you remember his name across from Copperfields, a George Florence, who is a mason from Millbrook, to uh, embed all of the mile markers from Poughkeepsie out to the Connecticut border 
in stone. He's a fine mason and he first did this one um, and I know it was done because I had requested it and this stone is near and dear to my heart because I lived near there, near that 20 mile marker. Mm -hmm. Um, and what's interesting is that all the stones from mile marker 20 out in through Amenia to the Connecticut border are covered with this stone. But the one I showed you at the bottom of the Taconic exit, um, from Washington Hollow the other direction, they are not covered. <laughs> so he apparently never got to that. So that's another genealogical type of uh, uh, project, I think, to look into. He may have been an older man at that point when he was asked. Um, okay, and then this is another mile marker going out that way. But you see there, you know, some places they write out Poughkeepsie, and others they put PC. So, next. Um, this map, going back to a Google map again, is showing us um, back where the Amenia Steakhouse would be up here and the toll house was represented around this corner. Um, and the blue is today. That's our road, De Laverne Hill, going down the hill to Amenia today. The black is the 1804 turnpike, a little more angular, we find, and it seemed to cut that hill short. Um, the reason I'm showing this is that if you're looking for the mile marker out here, which is right along in here, um, it should have been on the north side of the black line, but it is on the south side, so you have to look on your right when you are going out, and you will find that marker because the road was changed next. Um, it's another mile marker out past Millbrook School. And then um, mile marker 23 is the one at the Amenia Steakhouse point that I was just talking about. And it's covered with poison ivy, so you have to be careful. But that stone does stand. And I think the turnpike would have gone right there on that side. So it would have been on the north side of the turnpike. Next. <laughs> OK, and these are two more, the 26, 27, out um, in Amenia, at the other end of Amenia, near Troutbeck. And there's still another one or two stones that we have not found, but they may well be there. Um, next. Now, on the Dover branch, uh, the Dover branch, we found only one milestone remaining. And this area is between Nine Partners Lane and Lakeview Drive, and then you go down the hill and Duchess Day School is down there. In between here on this stretch is Booth Court. Um, the road in the 1920s was changed to the blue. This is the black is the original turnpike, 1804, and the blue is now what we drive on Route 343 down to Dover. Mm -hmm. And behind what I like to call the door to the Secret Garden is that milestone, milestone 16, um, a uh, Miles, uh, a, a Charles Marshall, I'm sorry, Charles Marshall built his home in what is now Booth Court, and he had extensive gardens and stone walls, um, but his house stood behind here. Okay, next. This is his home. Um, it's circa 1900, um, and he called it Milestone. Mm -hmm. um, it was a beautiful home, but it burned down at one point. Next. This is the stone, the 16-mile marker, and here it is embedded. So the, today, the route, well, even then, the 1804 turnpike would have been here. Today, it's out here farther from that stone wall. Uh, this is Booth Court, and here's the 16-mile marker embedded in that stone wall, and it's in very nice condition. Um, and it's placed accurately, because when I, I timed it from another mile marker, it was 16 miles, right on target. Next. Hmm. Ah, so the Duchess Turnpike Company and its demise. The railroad. This is Millbrook. 
This is the old department store. There's a train coming through. Um, so life progressed. After the turnpike had been built and served so many years, life progressed and innovations continue. The innovators were always looking for quicker access for farmers and industry from eastern Dutchess, even Connecticut, to the Hudson River, just like as in Columbia County, that eastern border to the Columbia to the Hudson River. They were always looking. Um, Poughkeepsie remained a central funneling point in this picture. And in fact, in 1832, the Dutchess County Railroad Company proposed a railroad from the village of Poughkeepsie to the Connecticut line, but the plan fizzled. Um, the first railroad to originate in Dutchess County was the Dutchess and Columbia, completed in 1869. So, 1804, when the turnpike was laid out and opened, to 1869, when the Dutchess and Columbia came through, That's a, a span of time. Next, <laughs> the blizzard of 88. In 1888, soon after the great blizzard of March 12th, the corporation surrendered its charter, gave to the town a deed of its property within the town limits, and its 16 miles became part of the public system. Next. So, are we back to the future? We still have turnpikes. So they're taking away our toll booths, so we don't have anyone to say thank you to, or ask directions to, or even gripe to, I suppose. And as technology moves us along, for good and for bad, toll roads are still being created, whether we like that or not. And we still have the same needs and the same gripes as those 200 years before us. That's the end. Thank you. <laughs>